Hi, good day students. You are welcome to today's lecture video. Today we'll be discussing about um, digestion, mobilization and transportation of fats. This is coming up under lipid metabolism and to be precise under catabolism of fatty acid. Production. Oxidation of long chain fatty acids occur uh, is a, a is occur it occurs in all living organisms as a source of energy, and the oxidation of this long chain fatty acids to acetyl-CoA is actually a central energy producing pathway in many of the organisms and and tissues. So cells can obtain their fatty acid fuels from three sources either fats that is consumed in the diet, fat that is stored in the cell as lipid droplets, or fat that is synthesized in one organ for export to another organ. Uh, in mammalian heart and liver, for example, uh, oxidation of fatty acid provides as much as 80% of the energetic needs under all physiological uh, condition. On average, about 40% or more of daily energy requirement of humans is in highly industrialized countries is supplied by dietary triacylglycerol. So we can say that triacylglycerol provide more than half the energy requirement uh, in some organs, organs such as heart, liver, and skeletal muscles. And stored triacylglycerols, uh, they are the sole uh, energy in many organisms, for example, hibernating animals and migrating bites. So on other organisms that are unicellular, so for instance, um, protists, they obtain their fats by consuming organs, uh, organisms that are lower in the food chain. And some of them store energy as a kind of cytosolic lipid droplets. And in higher plants, they store fat, uh, they mobilize fat that is stored in the seed that is actually during germination. So the electrons that are removed from fatty acids, acid oxidation, they pass through uh, the respiratory chain in the inner mitochondrial matrix. The energy that is obtained in the form of uh, ATP is actually used by the cell. The acetyl-CoA produced from the fatty acid oxidation can be completely oxidized or it can uh, be used for biosynthesis. So when it is oxidized to carbon dioxide in the citric acid cycle, it results in production of energy. So in some species and in some tissues, the acetyl-CoA has alternative fates. In liver, for example, the acetyl-CoA can be converted to ketone bodies. And these ketone bodies, they are water soluble fuels that are exported to the brain and other tissues when glucose is not available. So in higher plants, the acetyl-CoA serves primarily as biosynthetic precursor. It's only secondarily serve as fuel. Although the biological role of fatty acid oxidation, it differs from organisms to organism, the mechanism is essentially uh, the same. That is to say, the repetitive four steps process that is called beta oxidation, by which fatty acids are converted to acetyl CoA. So, cells can obtain their fatty acid fuels from three sources, as we have explained. And we can say that some species use all these three sources under various circumstances and others use uh, one or two of the uh, sources. Um, we can say dietary fats, how are they absorbed in the intestine? Dietary fats are absorbed in the intestine. So um, in vertebrates before ingested triacylglycerol can be absorbed through the intestinal wall, they must be converted from insoluble micro microscopic fat particles to a finely 
dispersed micro microscopic mycelis. And this solubilization is carried out by bile salt. So bile salt uh, that are produced in the gold bladder, they carry out the process of emulsification of dietary fats in the small intestine to form the uh, mixed micelles. And actually the bile salt can be considered as an amphiphatic molecule that acts like a biological detergent converting dietary fats to, into mixed micelles of bile salts and triacylglycerols. So they have um, hydrophobic uh, medium that is in hydrophilic medium that is water they have hydrophobic tail and and hydrophilic head so the hydrophobic tail aggregate themselves inside while the hydrophilic head outside uh, arrange themselves in such a way that they can interact with the uh, medium which is the water because the hydrophilic the they can interact with water, they love water. While hydrophobic, they don't want to interact with water, they kind of exclude themselves from where the water surface is. So how actually is the processing of dietary lipids occurs in, in vertebrates? Uh, in summary, you can see after the production of bile acid in the gallbladder and Gold bladder produces bile acid, and this bile acid or bile salt, rather, bile salt emulsify dietary fat into, into in the small intestine. And there we have in the small intestine, inside the intestinal uh, mucosa, we have what we call intestinal uh, lipase, which hydrolyzes triacylglycerol. It degrades triacylglycerol to fatty acid, free fatty acid, and glycerol. And the fatty acid and other breakdown products can be taken up by the intestinal mucosa and are converted into another triacylglycerol. So the triacylglycerol now can be incorporated within the, uh, uh, with cholesterol and apolipoprotein into what we call the uh, chylomicrons. Now, the chylomicrons are the uh, lipid uh, transporting uh, molecules. Okay, so in this case, the chylomicron is one of the lipids, example of lipid transporting uh, molecules. We have the high density lipoproteins, low density lipoproteins, uh, intermediate density lipoprotein, and, and chylomicrons. And the chylomicron consists of what we call apolipoproteins and the apolipoproteins in the chylomicrons include apoc2 apoc3 and apob48 so the apoc2 component is actual and of the chylomicron actually activates the intestinal lipase so um, the stages are applied here from one to to seven. So in, if you can look at step one is the emulsification after dietary, uh, emulsification of dietary fat after bile salt is be released from the gold bladder to form mixed micelles. And the second stage is intestinal lipase is degrade the triacylglycerol. And now the fatty acid and breakdown break products are taken up by the mucosal cells in stage three to, and are they converted into triacylglycerols. And in stage four, we have triacylglycerol that are incorporated with cholesterol and apolipoproteins into what we call the chylomicrons. Now the chylomicrons will now move through the lymphatic system of the blood and, and the bloodstream to tissues. And in stage six, we have the lipoprotein lipase. Uh, the uh, lipoprotein lipase is actually activated by a post T2 component in the capillary that converts triacylglycerol to fatty acid and, and glycerol. So it's the lipoprotein lipase that is activated by apoc 2 components of the chylomicron. So you have lipoprotein lipase now, uh, uh, now degrading the triacylglycerol to, to, 
produce free fatty acid which enters into the cell and you have uh, either oxidation of fatty acid uh, or to fuel or re-esterification to triacylglycerol or for storage. And this can occur in myocytes or adipocytes. So how is this calomicron look like? And this is the uh, molecular structure of calomicron. Uh, it is a uh, surface that is serving a surface layer of phospholipids with head groups facing the aqueous face, and it has triacylglycerol sequestered in, in the interior, which are the yellow, and they make up more than 80% of the mass, and several apolipoproteins that protrude, protrude from the surface. We have apolipoprotein uh, B48, uh, we have apolipoprotein C3 and C2, and they act as signals in the uptake and metabolism of calomicron content. The apolipoproteins, proteins, they are lipid binding proteins in the blood. They are responsible for transport of triacylglycerols, lipids, cholesterol, cholesterol esters between organs. And this is a typical representation of the uh, chylomicron and the apolipoproteins that are found within it and its constituent uh, lipids and phospholipids. So, and if you look at how are these uh, stored triacylglycerol mobilized. It's, it's actually a kind of hormone triggered mechanism. So the hormones trigger the mobilization of uh, stored uh, triacylglycerols. And we know triacylglycerols, they are called neutral lipids and they are stored in adipos adipocytes in the form of lipid droplets with a core of sterile esters and triacylglycerols that are surrounded by monolayer of phospholipids. The surface of this droplet is coated with uh, what we call uh, perilipins, okay? And th these uh, perilipins that we are talking about, they are a family of uh, proteins that restrict access of lipid droplets uh, preventing untimely lipid mobilization. Okay, so um, this is um, um, very important so that it's, it's the, uh, the mobilization of the lipid can be, or the fatty acid can be regulated. So this is actually um, the overall uh, mobilization of fat from the adipose tissue. Uh, we have uh, the hormone sensitive lipase. We have what we call uh, the glucagon and and the uh, epinephrine. So we know that these li neutral lipids they are stored in adipocytes, and also they are stored in uh, storage uh, uh, steroid synthesizing cells of adrenal cortex, ovary, and and testes. So how are they stored? They are stored in the form of lipid droplets. We have explained that. So now hormone signals need the need when these hormones, epinephrine and glucagon, signals the need for metabolic energy. Acylglycerols are mobilized from storage and are transported to skeletal muscles, heart, and renal cortex, in which the fatty acids are oxidized for energy. So when epinephrine and glucagon are released, they activate adenylyl cyclase, which produces the uh, uh, intracellular second messenger. And this adenylyl cyclase is found in the membrane of, of adipocytes, okay? Now, when its adenylyl cyclase is activated, it produces the intracellular secondary messenger called the uh, cyclic AMP. Now, the cyclic AMP now is actually activated by, uh, is act it activates what we call uh, protein kinase. So we have what we call cyclic AMP protein kinase A is now activated. So which now the PKA, protein, cyclic AMP protein kinase uh, PKA, phosphorylates perilipin A. 
and the phosphorylated perlipin A causes hormone sensitive lipase in the cytosol to move to the uh, hormone sensitive lipase now in the cytosol to move to the lipid uh, droplets, okay, and begin to hydrolyze the triacylglycerol to free fatty acid and glycerol. Another function of this PKA, it actually phosphorylates hormone sensitive lipase and it double uh, its activity uh, or to like uh, it's triple double or triple its activity uh, but you should note that more than 50 fold of the increase for fat mobilization is triggered by the epinephrine uh, 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 is due to perilipin phosphorylation so cells that have that do not have the gene for perilipin they have almost no response to increase to increase in cyclic AMP concentration. And their hormone sensitive lipase does not associate with lipid droplets. So the um, fatty acid generated by the hormone sensitive lipase, uh, actually uh, the hydrolysis of hormone sensitive lipase is, uh, it produces what we call uh, the hydrolysis of triacylglycerol by the hormone sensitive lipase produces the fatty acid. And now that this free fatty acid, they pass from the adipocyte to the bloodstream where they bind to a protein called albumin. And this albumin is, uh, uh, it has some properties, one of which is it has a molecular weight of 66,000 Dalton and it is consisting of the half of the total serum protein, and it's non-covalently bind to 10 free fatty acid per monomer, per monomer of the protein. So it's it combined with the free fatty acid and transports to uh, the tissues, skeletal muscles, heart, and renal cortex, whereby it's now released the free fatty acid into the cells, and also the albumin now that if you run back to the bloodstream and continues, continue the, the action. So fatty acid are activated and transported into the mitochondria. So the enzymes of fatty acid oxidation in animals are located in the mitochondrial matrix and fatty acid with chain lengths of 12 or fewer carbon atoms can enter without the help of membrane transporters. But those with 14 carbon or more which constitutes the majority of the free fatty acid obtained in the diet or released from adipose tissue, they cannot pass directly through the uh, mitochondrial membranes. They must first undergo the three enzymatic reaction of the carnitine. They must be activated. They must be activated. The first reaction is catalyzed by a member uh, of a family of isozymes present in the outer mitochondrial membrane. It's called the acyl-CoA synthesis. SLCoA synthetase, okay, which promote the general reaction as follows. We have conversion of fatty acid to fatty SLCoA in step one, this carboxylation ion. Carboxylate ion displaces the outer two phosphates of the ATP to form a fatty acyl adenylate and a mixed anhydride of carboxylic acid and phosphoric acid. And the other product is inorganic pyrophosphate, which is an excellent living group that is immediately hydrolyzed to form two inorganic uh, 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 phosphates. Now there is production of energy now, which pull the reaction into a uh, forward direction. This and the second reaction is a uh, tile group of coenzyme A. It carry out a nucleophilic attack, and the enzyme found mixed anhydra, anhydride displaces the AMP and forming the thioester fatty SLQA. And the overall reaction is hexagonic. So in essence here is actually the combustion of fatty acid to fatty SLQA, whereby ATP is utilized to produce, you have a fatty acid and ATP produce the fatty SLQA and you have the enzyme fatty acyl, uh, uh, fatty, uh, what do you call it? The enzyme fatty acid, fatty, fatty acyl CoA synthesis, syn 
tetes rather. So and this is the summary, fatty acid plus ATP catalyzed by fatty acyl-CoA synthetase to give you fatty acyl-CoA. So the fatty acyl-CoA now enters, uh, uh, it's at the cytosolic side of the outer mitochondrial membrane. So it has to be transported into the mitochondria and then oxidized to produce ATP. Or they can be used in the cytosol to synthesize uh, membrane uh, membrane lipids. So in the second reaction is uh, a, a reaction catalyzed by uh, is carnitine acyl transferase. This is um, it attach the hydroxyl group of carnitine to the uh, to it attach the fatty acid to the hydroxyl group of the carnitine to form what we call fatty acyl carnitine. This is a transesterification reaction. We call it uh, esterification reaction, you know, it's a reaction between organic acid and alcohol to form esters, right? So, and this reaction is catalyzed by fatty acyl uh, carnitine acyl transferase one. There is another one inside the mitochondrial matrix, which is carnitine acyl transferase two. So if you look at this is the outer mitochondrial membrane, and this is the cytosol, you have your fatty acyl CoA. Now carnitine acyl transferase now uh, attached carnitine to it to form what we call uh, fatty acyl carnitine. Now this fatty acyl carnitine will be what now transported. There is a transporter that will help in transporting the, the, the product via the entire membrane space into the what, what we call the uh, inner mitochondrial uh, membrane. Okay, so So the next step is the, you know, the transportation of the fatty, uh, the SLQA, it passes through the outer membrane and is converted to carnitine ester and the inter, in the inter membrane space or the carnitine ester is formed on the cytosolic phase of the outer membrane, then move across the outer membrane of the inter membrane space. So in essence, you have a transporter that is called uh, uh, SL carnitine or carnitine transporter that carries out the transportation of the uh, of the carnitine SL carnitine that is produced. Okay. So now you have the fatty SL carnitine that is now that enters into the matrix by facilitated diffusion through the SL carnitine or carnitine transporter of the inner mitochondrial membrane. Okay. Now after that, you have the third and final step of the carnitine shuttle, which you have the fatty SL group that is enzymatically transferred from carnitine to intramitochondrial coenzyme A by carnitine acyl transferase 2. The one outside the, uh, in the cytosolic phase is carnitine acyl transferase 1, and the one inside the matrix is carnitine acyl transferase 2. And with the function of the second one is it removes uh, the acyl group and trans, uh, that is transferred from carnitine to inter intramitochondrial coenzyme A. Okay, so now you, at the end of the day, you have your fatty acyl CoA and your carnitine is generated. So, and there is this, the isozyme located on the inner face of the inner mitochondrial membrane, regenerates fatty acyl CoA and releases it along with the free carnitine, that is what I just explained, into the matrix. And carnitine re-enters the intermembrane space via the SL carnitine transporter. 
So this three-step process for transferring fatty acid into the mitochondria, that is esterification to CoA, transesterification to carnitine, followed by transport and transesterification back to coenzyme A, links two separate pools of coenzyme A of the fatty acyl CoA, one in the cytosol and the other one in the mitochondria. These two pools, they have different function. The coenzyme A in the mitochondrial matrix is largely used in the oxidative degradation of pyruvate, fatty acid, and some amino acid, whereas the cytosolic coenzyme A is used in the biosynthesis of fatty acid. And the fatty SLQA in the cytosolic pool can be used for membrane lipid synthesis or can be moved into the mitochondrial matrix for ATP production. So you should take note that conversion of the fatty, conversion for, to the carnitine ester commit the fatty SL moiety to the oxidative phase. So that is to say, conversion to canteen ester is the what is the uh, red limiting uh, step. So it commits the fatty acid to oxidation. It has to be oxidized when that uh, transesterification is canteen of course. So how does uh, glycerol enter into the glycolytic pathway? You know, when you hydrolyze triacyl glycerol, you have free fatty acid and glycerol. So the fatty acid can be oxidized via beta oxidation to produce energy, or they can be used for biosynthesis of lipids. And the glycerol has to be what also uh, channeled into glycolytic pathway whereby it produces the remaining energy. So 95% of the energy of fatty acid catabolism is from the fatty acid, uh, uh, fatty, uh, free fatty acid, while the 5% is coming from the uh, glycerol. So uh, what is happening here, you have glycerol acted upon by glycerol kinase using ATP to get uh, to phosphorylate the glycerol to form what we call glycerol 3 phosphate. And glycerol 3 phosphate will be acted by glycerol 3 phosphate dehydrogenase, which uses NAD plus to produce NADH plus H. And the, at the end, the product that will be produced after the catalysis of this enzyme is dihydroxyacetone phosphate. Now, dihydroxyacetone phosphate can be converted to glycerol dehyde 3 phosphate by the action of triose phosphate isomerase, which is a glycolytic enzyme. Now, we have the glycerol dehyde 3 phosphate as a glycolytic intermediate. It now will now pass through glycolysis to form the uh, remaining 5% of the energy. Now, oxidation of fatty acid. Now, oxidation of fatty acid in the mitochondria takes place in three stages. The first stage is the, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> the first stage is, is, the first stage is the oxidation and is beta oxidation of the fatty acid. The fatty acid undergoes oxidative removal of the successive two carbon units in the form of acetyl-CoA, starting from the carboxyl end of the fatty acyl chain. So for instance, this figure shows the stage one, the stage two, and the stage three. Here, if you look at stage one, this is uh, a palmitic acid, 16 carbon saturated fatty acid, and the beta oxidation starts with, uh, from the carboxyl end, because this is the where you have attachment of uh, CoA, coenzyme A, to activate the fatty acid. So you have successive removal of 2 2 carbon in the form of acetyl CoA, okay, via the beta oxidation to form eight molecules of acetyl CoA, which can be used now in this stage two. But palmitic acid uh, is oxidized in the beta oxidation. We are how many cycles? Seven cycles. And seven cycles will give you eight molecules of acetyl-CoA. Now, the eight molecules of acetyl-CoA produce 
will now enter into the citric acid cycle whereby 16 molecules of carbon dioxide is produced with concomitant removal of 64 electrons which are passed to the reduced coenzymes NADH and FADH2. And this, they now give their electrons into the third stage where it occurs in the respiratory or electron transfer chain, where ADP will be now uh, phosphorylated to form, uh, with the inorganic phosphate to form ATP. This is actually oxidative phosphorylation. So that is a summary what happens. And, and for example, the 16 carbon pyrimetic acid, it undergoes seven passes through the oxidative sequences in each pass losing two carbon as a cell coa explained. At the end of the seven cycles, the last two carbons of the palmitic, palmitic, which are originally 16 and 15 carbon, remain as acetyl CoA. So the overall result is the conversion of the 16 carbon chain of palmitic to its two carbon acetyl groups of acetyl CoA molecules. And this is uh, the previous diagram that uh, I explained. Now, formation of each of the acetyl CoA requires removal of four hydrogen atoms, that is to say two pairs of electrons and four hydrogen atoms from the fatty SL moti by dehydrogenesis. I'm going to talk about the beta oxidation, uh, we'll explain that. So in the second stage of the fatty acid oxidation, the acetyl groups of acetyl CoA are oxidized to carbon dioxide in the citric acid cycle, which also takes place in the mitochondrial matrix. So the first stage, second stage, and in the first two stage of the fatty acid oxidation, uh, it produce reduced electron carriers, which are NADH and FADH, which in the third stage, they donate the electrons to mitochondrial respiratory chain through which the electron pass to the oxygen with the concomitant phosphorylation of ADP to ATP. So that is um, what happens. And this brings us to the end of this lecture. And coming up next, we have uh, beta oxidation of saturated fatty acids. Thank you for watching.